सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली वॉर्स कॉन्फ्लिक्ट इंसर्जेंसी वायोलेंस टेररिज्म ऑल दैट इज दी स्टफ ए जर्नलिस्ट लाइफ इज मेड ऑफ reporters in particular so while it's exciting covering all of that when action is on it may not be so exciting equally exciting when conflict stops and the dawn of peace takes place or the peace dawns but it is enormously more satisfying particularly if it's the end of a conflict or a bunch of conflict as is the case today within your own country so today we take note of a very significant change in india that change has been on for the past 15 years if not 20 but these things take time but today we can say that there is a turning point in the history of insurgency in the northeast now you ask anybody northeast how do you know the northeast oh there are insurgencies there there is violence there there is anti national activity there there is foreign funded or foreign trained organizations active there <clears throat> there is there is terrorism there today you can say with some satisfaction that a region which at its peak consumed the equivalent of 18 brigades 18 18 brigades of indian army and assam rifles which is a paramilitary force india's oldest paramilitary force so three divisions of indian army were fully deployed there in counter insurgency role for a long time at one point there were four or four plus divisions and i will tell you how in that region in that region now the army has pretty much withdrawn completely from counter insurgency counter terrorism role or what the armed forces called cict role i keep telling you that armed forces love the short form abbreviation so cict role so in a region where up to 18 brigades and some of these were oversized brigades of the indian army backed up by assam rifles were involved in fighting our own fellow countrymen in that region the army has withdrawn situation has become so so much better so good nothing is perfect but nearly perfect large parts of the northeast are today more peaceful and more lawful in many other parts of india including in the hindi heartland so that is how the army has been able to withdraw itself almost fully from this role now what used to be 18 brigades at one point or four and a half divisions and three divisions they are deployed regularly doing this those were divisions 57 8 two mountain divisions and 23rd infantry division in manipur there the entire region only one brigade that is 73rd mountain brigade based in assam in a place called laipuli which is just 6 kilometers from the upper assam town of tinsukia you can see it on the map that one brigade only is now involved in counter insurgency role and why are they there because that area also abuts arunachal's district of tirap and tirap if you, as you can see or tirap corridor as it sometimes called this juts into myanmar and the tribal ethnic stock of the people on the both on both sides in arunachal and in myanmar and then then in adjoining areas of nagaland is sort of similar they are ethnic cousins and that is where a little bit of naga insurgency of a group called nsan ky that still persists and some little infiltration takes place now and then and you see the odd incident but otherwise everything else has been withdrawn so third core of the indian army which was set up in mid 1980s in dimapur dimapur is the gateway to nagaland that was set up as a counter insurgency core at that point that core now sees counter insurgency as having gone out of its charter it is now able to focus fully on a large part of arunachal pradesh the lac etc that is the valong sector up to tirap sector instead of wasting its time fighting our own 
countrymen. That is the dawn of a new era in India's history. Now, what exactly has happened and how has this peace come about lately? So, you've seen that while the Nagas have been calm and Nagas now the only surviving major group which still carries arms, which still has its own armed centers where its quote-unquote troops are stationed, it has now decided to resume peace talks with government of India. That is the NSEN Isaac Moiva group. So they have resumed negotiations with the center. The other, other breakaway NSEN groups are pretty much now neutralized or they are very marginal. And that's why that one brigade is still sitting sort of between Arunachal. See the map of India in this place. It's a very critical place where, where 73rd Mountain Brigade is. It's sort of in the middle. This is the entry point into eastern Nagaland, into easternmost Arunachal Pradesh and the easternmost extremity of Assam as well. So barring that, it looks like Naga insurgency now has gone dormant. Most of it is over. It's gone dormant. It's moving towards peace. Mizoram has been completely peaceful. Uh, other parts of the northeast also are so peaceful or if at all there is some disturbance, that is not something that the local police or Assam Rifles, Assam Rifles, which is a large paramilitary force, today has 46 battalions. Uh, whose main remit is to look after the eastern frontiers or northeastern frontiers. They've also been given internal security duties now, replacing the army. So that is the big change in the northeast. Now, Naga Mizwa insurgency was the first to settle. Now, I will give you some turning points and some landmarks there in just a minute. Uh, Mizos were the first to settle. Naga settled in one large group in 1975 through Shillong Peace Accord. One lot kept on fighting. They are now coming around. In any case, there is a ceasefire. Tripura became normal, say about 10 years back, and it was done very adroitly. It was done between NDA government then and Tripura Chief Minister Manik Sarkar of the left front of CPM who worked together. And as normalcy came, they gave their people the peace dividend. That is withdrawing Armed Forces Special Powers Act from the entire state of Tripura on a police station by police station basis. Very serendipitously done, very effectively done. Lately, Modi government has been withdrawing AFSPA from large chunks in the Northeast. So peace dividend has been given and is being given to the people of the Northeast. Now this near total withdrawal of the army from counter insurgency role is also part of that peace dividend. Chances are, and I am hoping that this happens, and I think this will happen, that more and more areas in the Northeast will now be freed from Armed Forces Special Powers Act. That is also a message to other parts of the country, which may still be trouble prone, say Kashmir, for example, that if there is peace, if there is stability on the ground, you get a lot of rewards, including getting rid of Armed Forces Special Powers Act. You can't do it by fighting, because the more you fight, the more violence that takes place, the tougher it becomes for any state to take a softer view. And I, this I can tell you for, from my understanding of the modern history of India, there is no such thing in India as a soft state when it comes to national security. So far, we have seen only one government in India's independent history that was soft on national security. And mercifully, it was very short-lived, only for about 10 months. That was VP Singh's marvel in 1989-1990. Mercifully, it did not survive for too long, although we are still paying, the country is still playing for some of its sins on the national security front. But anyway, let's not to digress, see what's happened in the last few months. Just a couple of weeks back, Modi government signed a peace accord with some remnants of surviving rebel groups in Assam. These were mostly Adivasi groups. These look like small groups. Their names are very unfamiliar to all of us. You will see some of those names run on my screen. You can see them. These were eight groups who signed up a peace accord, who signed up on a peace accord with Modi government. And you might think these are very insignificant, tiny groups. But you know what? When they surrendered arms and came over ground, they were 1,182 carders. That's a lot of people, lot of insurgents in the bush. They can do a lot of damage. So that problem also got sorted. Before that, in 2019, Modi government signed up a peace accord with National Liberation Front of Tvipra. 
TWI, PRA, obviously in Tripura, called NLFT. 2020 was the big Bodo peace accord. Bodos, as we know, are plains tribals in Assam. They are a very large community spread out in large parts of Assam and they had become heavily armed and there were many insurgent organizations and now the last of them signed up on a peace accord. Then in Karbi Anglong, again see the map of Assam, Karbi Anglong is a very critically placed district. It's sort of in the hills of Assam but it leads from Assam into the other tribal states. It leads from Assam towards Manipur and Mizoram and is not far, far from Nagaland either. So Karbi Anglong, there was a group there. They also made peace in 2021. So that is how a big change has come about in this situation. So with this, the army can heave a sigh of relief. And the charge for counterinsurgency, God forbid, if something needs to be done, that is that has now gone to Assam Rifles. Assam Rifles, as I told you, is the oldest paramilitary force in India. It was set up in 1835 by the British. In fact, by East India Company as Kachar Levy. It was called Kachar Levy. It was just a bunch of people, just about 750 people, who were trained and who were armed and put into a uniform, essentially to protect the British-owned tea gardens in that area from tribal raids and that then grew into Assam Rifles which is a wonderful paramilitary force. In fact, if you look around in India, this is the only true paramilitary force. All the others including BSF who we call paramilitary forces, BSF may be yes to an extent but all the others CRPF and others are essentially central armed police forces. They are not paramilitary forces. Assam Rifles also is paramilitary, not just because its uniform looks more, more olive green like the army's, but also because it's officered almost entirely by officers drawn on deputation from the army for short tenures of service. And also many of its units have worked directly under the army's operational command. So it's now over to Assam Rifles, which has 46 battalions. Many of those battalions are arrayed along the India-Myanmar border. Many of those battalions are also used on the LAC, on the India-Tibet border. So some of those units will also be performing internal security duties. That's a big change. Now, how much of a relief is it for the army? So the army under the Eastern Command currently has four cores. The four cores are as follows. One is probably the most important core and the most critically placed core here, although it's very difficult to say which one is more critically pay, placed than the other because tomorrow somebody will argue and say, why is the fourth not the most important? So I'm not getting into that argument, but look at 33 core. 33 core is based in Siliguri. That is right in the middle of what is called the Siliguri neck, among the most vulnerable areas on India's map. And that is the area where people keep fantasizing about cutting the Northeast off from the rest of India. India's enemies externally have talked about it. India's enemies internally also may have fantasized about this. But that is where this core sits. That's a powerful core with a lot of strike forces in it. It also look after, looks after the Sikkim border, etc. So that is 33 core. It is called the Trishakti core. Then four core, I told you there will always be an argument with people saying why is four core not more critically placed than say 33 core. Four core is in Arunachal Pradesh. That is pretty much based in the area where we saw the disastrous war in 1962. In fact, four core was there. Four division is the one that melted under that onslaught and that's how areas like landmarks like Sela, Bomdila, Dirangzong, etc, etc, Tawang, they have become ingrained in our collective memory as a nation. So that core sits there and that core protects that part of Arunachal and its passes from the areas that China really covets because China really wants Tawang to begin with. All that is the remit of four core and that is where the last war took place. So four core also is a very crucially pl placed uh, core. Then the third one, is third core that's very interesting third core is in dimapur now if you look at the history of third core or three core of indian army you will find a mention in the first world war so the british had one then you will find a mention in the second world war but then 
it wasn't needed a third core wasn't needed so third core was resurrected by india by independent india in 1985 in a new avatar and this avatar was like a counter insurgency core so this core was now headquartered in dimapur which is the gateway to nagaland and this was going to control all the counter insurgency units armed forces units army units in the northeast so we told you 33rd core is in siliguri fourth core is in arunachal so, sort of in the kameng side this side of arunachal then third core is in dimapur so where is the fourth core so fourth core is the interesting one that is the new core the mountain strike core that is located headquartered at panagar in west bengal that is 17th core and all these cores have their names so fourth core is gajraj core it covers a lot of assam so gajraj being the elephant uh, 33 is trishakti core third is the spear core because you remember this is also the core which was specially tasked to handle tribal insurgency so i believe there is i can see there is some symbolism there and 17 core is called what else but brahmastra which also happens to be the name of the column our uh, defense editors nehesh alex philip has been writing so at at one point of time as i told you there were four, three full divisions operating in the northeast in the days i used to cover the northeast say between 1881 to 83 that's when insurgencies were at their peak there was eight mountain division in nagaland eight mountain division left a long time back early 90s to go to kashmir and has been there has not been needed since then so eight mountain division had quartered at a place called zakhama not far from kohima in nagaland 57 mountain division based in aizol and because insurgency had broken out in manipur as well then 23rd infantry division had been brought in from ranchi into manipur so three divisions there and why did i say four four and a half earlier there was a point when big insurgency or or maybe a combination of insurgency and terrorism broke out in assam as well with the alpha becoming so troublesome and that is when the division in rangia which is the 21st division it's been there for a long time the division in rangia and some other units in upper assam got involved also in counter insurgency in assam and that's when i said at some points of time 18 brigades plus were consumed in counter insurgency duties in fighting to protect india from its own in fact it was in that era that in assam we had two major operations launched by the army there was op bajrang and then there was op rhino all that hopefully pray to god is now history we are not going to see any more of that at least that can be a wish the 57 mountain division still happens to be under third core i believe it is still pretty much located near manipur it used to be in mizoram earlier it's now in manipur at a place called limakhong not far from uh, imphal that is where 23rd infantry day which was from outside the region had been brought in from ranchi at the height of the insurgency in manipur so you can see how much of the weight has gone off indian army's shoulders because indian army is designed trained equipped motivated to fight the country's enemies from outside to now if it needs to fight our own compatriots who may be waging war on the nation or the constitution it will do that but it's not something that the army enjoys doing or any army should enjoy doing and also it is not what it's trained for also it is not where its resources should be consumed so this is a very big change now how old is the insurgency in the northeast and how deep has it been and how troublesome has it been there is one way of looking at it that way is go to the national war memorial at india gate go walk around and just count the number of indian soldiers who died between 1952 and until now fighting various insurgencies in our internal internal conflicts including kashmir what that will not tell you however how many other fellow indians died because they took up arms from the wrong side they took up arms from the side of separatism so a lot of indians have lost their lives unfortunately to these insurgencies the first of which started in 1952 in nagaland it was on march 22 1952 the japo angami fizo founded the naga federal government as it was called 
and also launched Naga Federal Army and announced a war on the Indian state. And that is when Indian Army was sent in. In fact, that's what led to the passing of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. We spoke about this earlier in detail in an episode dedicated to AFSPA. Initially, as AFSPA was passed, it was called Armed Forces Special Powers Assam Act because Nagaland then was a district of Assam. And it's from there that the act evolved and also the, was employed in other parts of the country, now notably in Jammu and Kashmir. 11th November 1975 was the first big turning point when a large chunk, in fact a dominant chunk of the Naga rebels signed a peace accord with Government of India. In fact, even today's talks hark back to that peace accord which was actually a very short accord. So these groups gave up their weapons, they joined the mainstream, many of them joined politics, many of them became contractors, some of them joined Indian Armed Forces. In fact, two battalions of BSF then, Border Security Force, were specially constituted or specially founded to accommodate these former rebels and their commandant or self-styled Lieutenant General Zuheto Sema who everybody is still called general, but he was commandant of these two battalions. So some went there. As I said, some became contractors, businessmen, some became preachers, some spent a lot of time drinking and having fun and making up for all the time that was lost in their youth when they were in the bush fighting. So a bulk of the Nagas came out, but yet a very strong section of the Nagas, the NSC and IM, stayed underground and they kept fighting initially quite regularly, then sporadically, then sparingly, and now there's been this, this ceasefire for a very long time. NSCN was a more socialist formulation, a more leftist formulation, because the founders were trained in China. They were very influenced by the Chinese thought. That's why they named their group National Socialist Council of Nagaland. And Initially, as they came into Nagaland, they also started burning some churches and things. And a lot of the churches in Nagaland were made just of thatch, thatch and bamboo. So they started burning those because communists, you know, they had to be anti-religion. And they, then once they faced the pushback from the Christian community, because Nagas are almost entirely Christian, then they redefined their constitution or their manifesto and said, yes, we stand for a socialist Naga, Naga Republic, but we stand for a socialist Naga Republic for Christ. So since then they've been doing correction on their ideology, etc., etc. Today they are in very advanced stages of negotiations with government of India. I consider that an, as almost a done deal. It may take some time, but the chances of these people going back and launching a full-fledged insurgency, I would say are very poor. I'll never say anything is zero because is the separatist radical movement in Punjab over about five years back? I would have said, yes, it's over. Today, a combination of factors, including what's happening in Canada, the vote bank politics in Canada, to some extent with the Labour Party in Britain, that is again threatening to rise. So no, no problem dies forever. Problems have this bad habit of raising their head again, just when you get complacent. So India has to be watchful, so it doesn't look like it will come back soon again. How serious was the Naga insurgency? It was the most serious insurgency or threat that India has ever faced on internal security front. In 1960, in fact, I can't forget the date, August 26, 1960, incidentally I turned three on that day, that is the day when an Indian Air Force Dakota that was supplying Indian troops who had been surrounded by Naga insurgents in one of the remote positions in Nagaland, that was shot down by Naga rebels and its crew were taken prisoner. That was a Dakota, a transport aircraft. The crew were taken prisoner. Later, they were released. The captain of the aircraft, by the way, was the brother-in-law of film actor Devanand. He was his wife, Kalpana Karthik's brother. So he was released. The entire crew were released later. But Nagas were able to shoot down an aircraft of Indian Air Force. The next one was Mizoram. So Mizoram insurgency broke out in 1966. In fact, it was on 28th Feb 1966 that the first attacks from the newly constituted MNF, Mizo National Front under Lal Denga, took place. These attacks took place on 1st of March, you know, February is a small month. On 1st of March, Lal Denga declared a sovereign independent republic in Aizol and his troops 
or his rebels were about to overrun the treasury and the Assam Rifles headquarters there. Assam Rifles has had a battalion headquarters in Aizol forever. So they were about to overrun it. There were families there. Remember, this happened when Indira Gandhi had been Prime Minister for just over a month. 11th of January 1966, Lal Bahadur Shastri died. After that, she was sworn in Prime Minister. And then it took her a couple of weeks having a vote of confidence. So formally, she had been Prime Minister for just over a month. And how did she respond? She unleashed the full power of the Indian Air Force on the rebels. Now, this is something that people write about at great length, saying, oh, how awful that government of India used its own air force against its own people and there is a lot of resentment in Mizoram about it and I can understand that. New generations will say, oh, my own country used the air force against us. But take your mind back to February 1966. Just a couple of months back, just a few months back, India had fought a major war with Pakistan, the 1965 war. Before that, three years before that, India had fought and lost a war against the Chinese. Now, India's second Prime Minister in succession after Nehru, Nehru and Shastri, died while in office, died in harness. And now a newbie Prime Minister, who nobody took seriously, she had taken over. And she also had no compunction, no hesitation in unleashing the greatest amount of firepower she could find at that point to preserve India's integrity. That's the reason I said earlier on that India hasn't really had any government that was weak or frail on, on national security. Now, we know ultimately what happened with the Mizo Rebellion. In, on 30th June 1986, there was a peace accord signed between Lal Denga and Rajiv Gandhi. All Mizo rebels came over ground, joined the mainstream. Lal Denga, in fact, after that became Chief Minister of Mizoram as well. He died, unfortunately, of cancer in 1990. But Mizoram has remained peaceful since then. Manipur. Manipur insurgency started in 1978. So a man called Nami Rakpam Visheshwar Singh, he founded an organization. He was a leftist communist, an extreme left uh, communist. He founded an organization called People's Liberation Army, very original name, particularly if you're inspired by the Chinese. He went to Tibet, he got trained with his troopers and they came back and they, they caused quite a bit of problem, which is the reason I said the 23rd Infantry Division was brought in from Ranchi into Manipur and became the third Indian Army Division to be fully employed in counter-insurgency role. Later in an operation, Visheshwar Singh was caught. He was caught. He was caught by a young second lieutenant, I think at that point, called Cyrus Pithawala, who rose to be a general. Uh, three star I think in the army he was injured in the head got Ashok Chakra for that operation Visheshwar Singh was tried the state could not really find any charges to stick against him except maybe a charge of arms act finally he was released he joined the mainstream in fact he remained in custody for a long time then he got bail and I found as, as I was researching it I found the story that I had done on bail for Visheshwar Singh in 1984 in India Today magazine. So please see that story. I'm sharing a link with you. He then joined the mainstream. He became an MLA. So once again, it was Indian democracy and the constitutional system which absorbed one more, one more insurgency. And chances are that will happen to others also. Tripura. Tripura had the big Mandai massacre where hundreds of Bengalis were killed. Estimates vary, but it could be anything from 500 to 1,000. They were massacred by a group called Tripura National Volunteers, TNV. And that happened in, in 1980. So what, what happened to TNV? TNV and then its offshoot subsequently, they all signed up on peace accords and joined the mainstream. The founder of TNV, Vijay Rangkhal, who was a tribal leader at one time, the most wanted man, in Tripura and among the most wanted insurgents in all of India. He became an MLA between 93 and 2008. He was an MLA. He is today the president of the Indigenous Progressive Regional Alliance or TIPRA, T-I-P-R-A as it's called, whose chairman, by the way, is Pradyot Dev Burman, the Maharaja of Tripura right now, who also founded his own tribal party. In Assam, we had all this alpha firework that went on for almost 15 years and I told you Ab Bajrang and Ab Rhino took place. But once again, 
there is peace now there. So what better evidence there can be except data. So see these three graphics and these three graphics are from a story by our defense editor Snehesh Alex Philip who is writing about this change in the Northeast and from whose story I have drawn greatly. And these three graphics tell you the first graphic yearly fatal fatalities for civilians since 2000 that is in 22 years. So the highest is in 2519 civilian fatalities. How much it, is it this year? 9. So it is still 9 too many but 519 to 9. Security forces. The highest was in 2003 in this 22 year period. 2003 145 security forces personnel killed in the northeast because of insurgencies. What is the number this year? It is 2. Two too many, but only two. Two is a lot better than 145. Third, the deaths of insurgents, terrorists, extremists. Highest in 2009, 607. The lowest this year is 7. Once again, low is good. I know the immediate thing would be why are more insurgents not dying? That's because there aren't that many insurgents anymore. And that is the good news. And that is something that we should celebrate right now. Where is this data from? This data is from South Asian Terrorism Portal.